respected president of the Royal Treasurer, uh, Treasurer of the Secretary, and uh, esteemed members of the uh, Rotary Club of Madras South, and my friends from uh, the Rotary Club of Madras East as well. And I must say a special mention to Dr. Venkat, who's been a very good friend over the years, and I'm glad that he joined your club, who's an amazingly good urologist. Uh, and uh, special thanks to Dr. Ma uh, Mr. Madhu as well, because uh, you know, when he introduced me, I was looking back to see whether he's introducing somebody else or something. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, but he mentioned your name in the video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always, uh, you know, such, you know, when he called me, it was uh, such a polite way in which he sent an email that you really cannot uh, refuse such a polite invitation, and I'm happy to be here. So it's a pleasure to address this club once again. And uh, my talk today is about um, common urological problems. Can I please have the slides set up? Just one second, please. Yes, thank you. So, uh, this is my hospital, <coughs> the Chennai Urology and Robotics Institute. If, if you ever happen to pass by OMR, uh, it's next to about 9 kilometers from this exact place because I calculate my clinic is very close to Savera Hotel. So, <laughs> so it's about 9 kilometers from this place. But, uh, you know, you know, and we just started this a year ago. December 2014 was the time when we started. Uh, 2000, I'm sorry, December 14, 2018 was when we started Curie Hospital. So uh, it's been it's been a lot of pleasure running the place and a lot of pain as well. So we've, we've never been entrepreneurs. It's the first time, um, and um, yeah, at, we're not great business people. So I've been three generations of doctors, but never want to be in business. So um, one of the members, one of the gentlemen here, is Arun Narayan, is my auditor, and he knows. <laughs> he's been always advising us to look at it uh, in a bit more uh, business way, but it's a bit difficult for us. Next. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk today about uh, urology. So what is urology? Who's a urologist? What does a urologist do? So we are uh, doctors who look at uh, the urinary system, the kidneys, that's the, the, that, that organ, the tube from the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, the prostate, and the sex organs of the male, not the women. Women go to gynecologists for the sexual problems, but for urological problems, we deal with uh, women, for, for women as well. So we are doctors who deal with the urinary system in all genders, and the sexual organs only for the male, not for the women. So, you know, uh, it, it, it's not like I can... The trouble with urology is you can't go tell everybody I, I'm, a, I'm a urologist. Well, actually, we're better than the colorectal guys. <laughs> So when my, when my son went to school in the U.S., and there's this, what's your father do uh, professionally and so on. So he came and asked me, Rafa, what are you doing? He said, he was in kindergarten, which is a very tiny kid. And I told him we're dealing with the urinary system. And I tried my level best to explain it to him. And then uh, in the U.S., they call passing urine as VV. Yes? So I told him, well, we deal with VV and all that. So next day, when I go pick, up, uh, pick him up in school, the entire class, kindergarten class of celebration school in the U.S. shouted, "We be doctor." <laughs> so, so I'm a we be doctor. That's what we do. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's you know to describe this is very simple. Let's see. Hopefully, yeah. So, what are the commonest symptoms? So, when we talk about symptoms in general, we divide it into upper tract. That's the kidneys and the ureter. And the lower tract bladder and the prostate. So up, very simple, upper tract, lower tract. So symptoms relating to the upper tract, symptoms relating to the lower tract. So that's way up in your, the kidneys are up here in, at, 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 in your loin and the bladder is down there close to your pelvis. So it's upper tract, lower tract, very simply put, right? So I'll talk about the various symptoms and then you can ask me questions, we can stop at any time. Just feel free to stop me, ask the basic idea of this program is awareness. I won't, I don't want to run over your fixed time, so at any point in time, just tell me stop, I will stop. Right? So, what are the upper tract symptoms? Commonest is pain. Uh, and pains, you know, pain, fever, blood <coughs> in the urine, and all that. These are very simple 
things that everybody can understand. If, if, if it's up in the loin, think of kidney pain. And if you have blood in the urine, so this is the commonest symptom that can that gets missed. Right? So all of you are comfortable with English? Like I'm comfortable with Tanglish, but I hope, hope that's okay. Right. So because I'm gonna say this, uh, blood in the urine, a lot of time people come to me and say, Doctor, I've had this blood in the urine came about six months ago and either we to mommy on the students on an It can never be soon. If there is blood in the urine, it needs to be looked into immediately. Where did it come from and why did it come? Mandatory for us to know. You can never neglect that. Right? So blood in the urine is very one of the most important symptoms that you need to be uh, cognizant of. Right? So the next step is, why, why do we get these sort of symptoms? One is you can have stones. Everybody gets stones these days. Yes? Nobody doesn't get stones. Infection, kidney infection, very common in women, and then cancer. Right? This is a term that we are constantly going to hear again and again and again. Because this is probably one of the biggest troubles that we're going to face as we progress. Because all everything else we can manage easily. This is where we usually run into trouble. Right? So what is cancer? Right? Anybody, what is cancer? Yes. Malignancy, that's a good term, that good way of putting it. But so in, in, throughout our life, cells in our body, are, yeah, they, they born, they multiply, and then they die. Yes? If a single cell forgets how to die, and it constantly multiplies, that becomes cancer. Right? So, and, and if you, in Tamil, you can say this as iraka maranda or cell. Right? Some the cells that's forgotten how to die. It constantly multiplies, goes, goes to different organs of the body, finally consumes the person. Right? That's cancer. Right? <coughs> yeah. So let's go to stones. <coughs> most common in women in men, and three times more common in women uh, in men than in women. And sedentary lifestyle. If yeah, we don't drink enough water, then again that's a cause of kidney stones. Right? So small, small video, just don't worry about the audio. Well, just it, it, it spawns us very small things. Like in summer, kardigimani. Of course. Not drinking proper water. Yes. How much water is it? Fantastic question. Right? So, again, let's look, quickly look at this video. I'll come to that question again. So, if a stone gets formed in the kidney, it usually forms as a very small entity, and then it progresses down and comes down out of, out of this tube. Right? But it's not that simple. It can get stuck anywhere. Right? The important thing is these tubes, the ureter, the kidney, these don't have any pain sensation. If I take a knife and cut the kidney, you will not have any pain. But if the tube distends, then you'll have pain. So the stone touching the ureter, pushing it, pressing it won't cause pain. But if it blocks it, and then there's urine getting collected above that, then you'll have a lot of pain. So very good question. We should address this right away. How much water should one drink? Right? It, it, the simplest way of looking at it is <coughs> when you pass urine at any point in time, it should be the color of the water that you drink. Right? Or at least like champagne color. Yes? So if it is deep yellow, that means you are drinking too little water. So don't allow it to go to that phase. Right? Urine production, the, 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 there's a dye that get, gets secreted constantly. So if you, if you, it's called urochrome, and if you drink about two glasses of water, then this dye over a period of 24 hours will get secreted into two glasses of water. It will look very deep yellow. If you drink three liters of water, right, and the same amount of dye gets secreted over 24 hours. And imagine that dye going to three liters versus two glasses, or 200, 300 ml. Yes? So naturally it's going to be very pale best is to be in the pale segment. Right? If you are if you are working out in the sun all the time, then you are going to drink 3 to 4 liters. If you are sitting in an AC room, you are, maybe you need less. But at any point in time, your urine should be champagne color. It's not champagne. Champagne. <laughs> champagne. <laughs> so, drinking more water is good or bad? Uh, within reasonable limits. In our country, up to 3 liters is acceptable. Beyond that, you will be 
We bring more VV. So, yeah. Making more water with more VV. Yeah, more VV. Does it affect the kidney if you drink more water? Not really. It doesn't, you know, beyond 5 liters, if you have certain medical conditions, it may trouble you. But up to 3 liters, I would say, is acceptable. Other thing is, you know, constantly when I see patients with stones, I give them this advice. Tani nariya kudi tani. Then I had a patient for whom I had to specify. Kudi tira tani. <laughs> so again, so this is commonest form. The stones, everybody forms stones, but they, when they are like sand particles, they tend to come out of the urine. If you if you don't drink enough water, then they slowly become bigger and bigger and bigger and cause trouble. So our goal is to prevent it from happening, right? So some people get very huge stones. This is a huge stone in the kidney. The entire size of the kidney is stone. These are staggered calculi. These we usually get in people in, in, the, in the north, Rajasthan and those sort of places. Gujarat, they have a stone belt. But sometimes in India, we get, in, in Chennai, we get them as well. Right? So, cystoscopy is a way of looking into the bladder. Cysto means bladder, scopy means looking into the bladder, and we find a lot of uh, different entities that can trouble us. So, again, this is how we break stones that come from the tube to the kidney. Right? So, it's so again a small video. So we've got a camera that's as small as the refill of your pen. Okay, it can go through your passage, go up to the stones, and then laser the stone. Now we've got laser that's exceptionally very effective. We can just touch the stone with laser and it becomes powder. So it comes out through our passage. So there's no cutting, stitching, open surgery. It's no longer done for stones, never. Okay, 20 years ago when I was uh, in med school, it used to happen. But in the last five years, I've never had to open a patient for stone. Okay. Never. What size? Right? Whatever the size, you can get the stone up without, without, uh, even the size of the entire kidney, you can get it up. You don't need to open it up. Right? That's where we are right now. Okay? So, again, cystoscopy is looking into the bladder. This is how stones look in the bladder. And then PCNL, again, this is another way of doing, like you asked, what size of stones? Large stones, we may need to put a small puncture through the back. We don't need to, we won't go through your passage. But again, this is one of the ways in which we uh, take stones up, right? Go to the quick, we won't, yeah, this is how we, so again, small puncture goes into the kidney and again, we pulverize the stone and take it up. So there is no open surgery for stones anymore, right? In fact, urology has become minimally invasive and, and uh, it, it's been some years since I've done open surgery for this, right? So again, next, and the other thing is, we as a specialty, or now we're more dependent on investigations. And you know, remember those days in Tamil movies used to, yes sir. Does back pain be, does it mean that you have a bone back pain? Like, it has to be a specific type of back pain. Uh, colicky pain, severe in nature, on and off, intermittent and so on. If you go to a doctor, they'll immediately pick up if it's a stone pain or something. So as a specialty, we are dependent on investigations. I used to remember those days in Tamil movies, they used to pulse, uh, look at the pulse, the doctors in the village and say, hey, you're pregnant or something like that. Yeah. Hey, we are not that sort of doctors. Yeah. At least we don't have that skill. Right? We are dependent more on investigations nowadays. Because if you look at the organs, they are too deep inside for us to palpate. So for instance, this is the pro bladder and this is the prostate and we can't touch this area at all, right? It's below the pelvic brim, we can't even feel it. So if there's a problem, we necessarily depend on investigations. So I get a lot of questions from uh, patients coming in. Sir, I think we just have some burning, why do you think we need an ultrasound scan or something like that? But there are organs that we can't touch at all. We really need to have those investigations to go to the next step, right? So again, these, this is kidney disease. Again, um, uh, again, we can't feel this. So I can feel the top portion of the body, but the bottom portion we can't feel. However much I press my hand, I won't be able to touch the kidneys. So we necessarily have to do investigations to find out if there's anything going on. Okay? So again, uh, tumors in the kidney, again cancer, um, they don't have any symptoms at all. They don't produce symptoms. Or at least they produce symptoms at a very late stage. So, best is, if at all possible, like once in a year, I would urge you to get a master of checkup, right? Because these things, 
uh, certain things, if we detect it early, it's a hundred percent curable. Right? But if it if it produces symptoms, it means it's at a later stage. Right? So we need to get it before any cancer, like right, for that matter. If it is only in the organ, it's curable. If it spreads beyond the organ, it's difficult to cure. So we need to get it before it spreads. Right? So again, CT scan. So again, reconstructive image, this is how the cancer looks. And if you look at this MR angiogram again, this tiny entity here is about three to four centimeters. This is the size of the kidney. And nowadays, we can save the kidney and take out only the tumor. That's possible, right? That's also, you know, we don't, you know, about 10 years ago, we would take out the full kidney. And now we would take out only the tumor and save the kidney. That's possible with uh, robotics. Right? So again, quick tea. Yeah, so this is where we are at present. So taking out the kidney, entire kidney nowadays is no longer acceptable. We only take out the tumors for even big tumors. Right? So now we come to the lower tract. So upper tract is done. Now we're going to the lower tract. Lower tract is again the bladder, the prostate, and the tube from the, the prostate coming out. Right? So men have about 20 centimeters long tube. Women have only 4 centimeters. They don't have this, yes? So, the women get infections very easily. And there's a very good number of ways to prevent it. I can discuss that as well, right? So, lower urinary tract symptoms, very, very common. Everybody, trust me, everybody in this room has gone through this, yes? So, frequency at some point in time, right? Adikari well, yeah? And then interrupted flow. The flow is not great, right? In, in college days, in school days, I'm quite certain you've had competitions where who does the <laughs> distance? Yes? Or can you write your name in the sand or something like that? <laughs> Ali, I studied in Don Bosco, it was a thing that was <laughs> But now uh, you know, but now it falls at your feet or something. You can't do a distance. Right? That's a, that's that's a, a sign that your prostate's getting enlarged. And then difficulty, painful, burning, and blood in the urine. Again, blood in the urine is a symptom that cannot be neglected. Right? And pain in the back and hips, pain during ejaculation. This again, very common in younger age group. When you're in your 20s to 40s, pain when you ejaculate, ejaculate means there's some infection in the prostate. Okay? And the blood, I'm talking about blood in the urine, blood in the urine, blood in the urine. The commonest cause of cancer in the urinary system is Anybody? Smoking. Smoking. Bladder cancer, kidney cancer. Smoking is the most commonest cause. So if you are with smokers, I would urge you to move away. Right? If you are smoking, this is the best time to stop. Stop immediately. Don't even go near smokers. Don't even, you know, because this passive smoking is dangerous as well. And has the same risk as smokers. So we now, you know, previously we used to think we may get cancer if we smoke, but now we know for sure that we will get cancer. Okay? So smoking is a big no-no. Okay? The cigarette packet says that you know, smoking kills or something. Yeah? So again, so these are the symptoms, low urinary tract symptoms, and um, and do these symptoms always mean cancer? Not really. Right? It just means that you could have some trouble with the prostate. Right? It could be a big prostate, it could be infections in the prostate, it could be cancer, bladder cancer, or prostate cancer as well. Again, these are possibilities. Okay. This, uh, yes, is sir. India is supposed to be, or Indians, are they particularly vulnerable to prostate cancer? So we hear about India being the diabetes capital. Is it uh, cancer so, capital? I'm going to touch that a bit later on. Um, I will answer your question as the talk goes on, if that's okay. Yeah. So, and when somebody comes to us, um, and the only way to examine the prostate is through your back passage, right? So, uh, that's the way we feel your prostate. A lot of patients come to me and say, Doctor, I've come for a urinary problem, what are you doing with the back passage? Right? My answer is, listen, I'm not enjoying this. <laughs> we have to do this. Yeah? That's the only way I can touch your prostate. Yeah? So, that's how we examine the prostate. This is how the, the, this part of the prostate I can feel with the finger. Right? And that can tell us whether there's a 
malignancy in the prostate or not, how big the prostate is and so on. Okay? So that's one of the ways we do it. So again, investigation, go to a doctor these days, you have to have these tests done, urine tests, blood tests and so on, you know, because it's no longer acceptable that we just see you and then get uh, some tests done, uh, you know, just give you some medicines. We need to know what exactly you're having in order to give you the best possible outcome. So we do, we do rely on a lot of these tests. Okay? So prostate cancer, I'm coming to your question sir. So throughout the world, prostate is the most common cause of cancer. In India, not so. Right? In India, we've got other people, lung cancers, uh, again, pretty high. Indians as such are not, uh, you know, prostate cancer not way up here. So the trouble with Indians is different, I'll just tell you what it is. So in the mortality for prostate cancer in England is about 27%. 100 people come to, to you with prostate cancer, 27 people probably die because of it. In India, it's 72%. Right? 100 people come to us, but 72 people die because of it. Another point about this, in the United States, this is the incidence of prostate cancer, right? And, and in India, this is where we are in India, right? But if you look at incidence to mortality rates, so mortality to incidence rates, this is where United States is and this is where India is. So the likelihood of Indians dying from prostate cancer is much higher. And the reasons for that are, our disease is slightly different. We get more aggressive disease. And the bigger reason is lack of awareness. And if I was practicing in the US, 80% of people who come to me with prostate cancer come in a curable state. But in India, 80% come at a stage where it's spread. So that's one of the biggest troubles in our country. Right? And that's what I'm trying to say. We've got the detection methods. It's a very simple blood test called the PSA test. It costs about 300, 400 rupees. And we've got the treatment, we've got the best possible treatment for prostate cancer. But we still lose a lot of patients because, only because of the lack of awareness, nothing else. Right? So that's probably one of the biggest changes that we're trying to do in, in, in our foundation. I'll tell you, talk to you a little bit about the foundation. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Right. So, how do we diagnose? We've got a very simple blood test. And then I do a rectal examination, and then we also can potentially do an MRI if need be. And who is at risk? Older men. Every year after the age of 45, the risk of prostate cancer increases. Right? At about 85, trust me, more than 50% of men will be harboring some sort of cancer. But when it comes at that age, it won't trouble us too much. But if it comes at a younger age, we need to get on top of it very quickly. Okay? So family history. Father has prostate cancer, we have double the risk. Father and your uncle have prostate cancer, we've got 11 times the risk of developing prostate cancer. Right? So again, we've got to be, these are persons at risk. Okay? We need to know exactly what's happening and we need to get on top of uh, these men very quickly. So, if there's one statement that I want you to remember from this talk, is this early detection can cure prostate cancer? A very very simple simple statement. If we detect it when it's within the organ, there's a hundred percent cure rate. We can cure it completely. Okay? And the only thing that's preventing us from getting more men diagnosed is the lack of awareness. Only recently, in the last few years, has prostate cancer come into mass cell checkups. Before that, it wasn't there. Right? Nobody knew what it was. Now, we, we, with the foundation, we're trying to, this is what we're trying to prevent happening. This is a person who's come at a late stage where the cancer spread to the bones. So this is what we don't want happening, right? So, and that's one of the reasons we started the Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation. One of the goals of the foundation is to prevent needless suffering because of prostate cancer. Why do I say needless? It really is needless. If you detect it early, you're going to cure it. If we know about it, if we are aware about it, we can easily cure this. So that's one of the reasons. And uh, awareness, health education and training, one of the goals of our foundation is that's one of the reasons I'm here in front of you. 
and it was. I'm going to quickly talk about the foundation and then move on to other things as well. So again, we started in 2015, and um, we, several campaigns have been conducted only to increase awareness about prostate cancer. Everywhere we go, I talk about this Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation and the work that we do. Um, and uh, uh, this is again a lot of uh, meetings. And this is one of my favorite programs that we did. We did a Walk to Light campaign. This is Chennai Lighthouse. And we lit it blue for about a week's time. And blue is the color of prostate cancer. And we wanted everybody to, uh, you know, there was a big board hanging. And a lot of uh, people came up to us and asked what it was about and so on. So this is what we're trying to do. And this is, again, something very close to my heart, protecting men who protect us. Our ex-servicemen and people from the army, they would uh, get screening and treatment. So um, I won't, um, you know, this is a very humble message to you. The foundation as such is pretty, we don't need a lot of support. But we need support in terms of each one of you talking to one other person about prostate cancer. That's where we're lacking. And if this message is spread, it's, it's all that, I, that I'm asking you for. Right? Talk to about one other person about prostate cancer in general. So, quick word about robotic surgery. Then we'll discuss something about erectile dysfunction. Do I? Do we have a little bit five minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I've already spoken to a lot of you about robotic surgery, but just small, just three minutes about it. So this is where we sit and operate. Right? It's no, not. It's a master-slave mechanism. It doesn't operate on its own. The robot is not an. You know, it can't work on its own. So what I do outside, sit here and do, happens inside the patient. And it was an American um, military funded program. You've heard of all these predator drones and all that, predator attacks? Yeah. Yeah. They started out like that. And they are able to control an aircraft 4,000 miles away. And an aircraft, I'm quite certain, is, is more very complex entity. And we can do something similar sitting 10 feet away. So. And the reason it was started was um, the American Army had one doctor for every 2,000 soldiers. And they didn't want this doctor to be in the battlefield. They wanted to protect the doctor. And he could operate on an injured soldier sitting 100 miles away. So that was the reason it was started. But then it came into mainstream medicine as well. So again, I can see three-dimensional um, vision at 10 times magnified. The instruments are pretty small. And it can move much faster, much more than a hand as well, human hand. And if you look at the human hand, I think it's you know, one of the master uh, pieces of evolution, right? Um, or God's creation. Right? So we can touch about 90% of what the human hand can do. And in certain areas, 130% of what the human hand can do, right? So we still can't feel as well as the human hand, but we can move a lot more than the human hand can. And we can move it a thousand times without getting tired. So that's possible. Right? Tiny instruments, and this video is going to show you how we do it, do this. Right? So, yeah, so what I do outside exactly <coughs> happens inside. So if I move three inches, I can make it move three millimeters inside. If I move three you know, three millimeters outside, it can move three inches inside. So it doesn't have tremor. As we grow older, our hands, everybody will get tremors. Right? So if I'm sitting on the console, that tremor is a thing of the past. It has tremor filtration. Right? So even if my hands are shaking like this, I can operate very well. Right? So this is what I see. So three-dimensionally, what's inside the abdomen? Right? So it's like me sitting inside where I need to operate and operate. Ten times magnified. And, and how would you like to see some videos? There are going to be some blood, as in there's some women folk here. Would it be okay? Yes? All of okay yes. with that? Yes. <coughs> no, okay. So, this is where we sit. This is what goes into the patient. And this is the vision cut. Right? So, this is the hospital that I worked in in the US. Uh, this is the robot. It's just coming into the patient. The patient's legs are there, the head is towards us. And we've already put tiny ports in the abdomen of the patient. And this is how we attach the camera, this is how we attach the instruments. 
and we sit on the console and we can operate. The console can be anywhere between 10 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, up to up to 400 feet. Right? Beyond that, there's a lag in in the signals coming from the patient to the console. And they used to try this transcontinental robotic surgery, but the, the speed wasn't fast enough. So this is how we attach the instruments, put it inside. I'm going to show you another quick, quick video about what we do exactly in a prostate. So, did I hear some breath going in or something? I don't know. Right. So this is the prostate. This is. These are the nerves that go to the penis, which are responsible for erections. Right. If I go a millimeter this side, the patient loses erections. If I go a millimeter this side, we get into cancer. So because I've got 10 times magnification compared to what I see with my human eye, and the instruments are millimeters in size, I can get exactly in the right plane. You know, 20 years ago, the main goal of a person getting prostate cancer surgery was cure the cancer, right? But now, is not only cure the cancer, but give them the quality of life as well. So no longer acceptable just to cure the cancer. We need to give them a proper quality of life. And that's where this robotic surgery comes in. Are we increasing longevity? No. Right? If they've got cancer that's spread, I can't change that. But can I increase their quality of life? A hundredfold. Yes, that can be done. That's where we are at present. Right? So I've got another small video of kidney tumor as well. I won't bore you with that, but go to a more interesting topic, very quickly, right? So, yeah, this is what I wanted to talk about, right? Erectile dysfunction, there were three, just three slides, okay? So 90% of the time, this is, you know, this is what I want you to see, right? So a lot of people don't seem to realize that men have an erection because blood flows into the penis, right? It flows in at a very fast rate and doesn't come out. It stays there, stays there for a long time. And that's one of the reasons why a penis gets erect. And if you look at this, uh, you know, you should go and try this. Every time your heart pumps, if you've got an erection, the penis will move up a bit like that, right? So that's because the blood gets pumped into the penis. And anything that prevents this blood from run, rushing into the penis will cause erectile dysfunction. Very, very simple, right? So, whatever factors reduce the blood flow, right? A lot of patients come to me and say, Doctor, I don't have a good direction. Are you exercising? No. Right? So, you have to imagine the penis is exactly like an organ, right? Any organ, like your heart, like imagine it's a small man. Anything that's good for the man is good for the penis. And if you exercise well, if you eat healthy, is very good. So erectile dysfunction again is a general sign that your health is not good. You need to be exercising more constantly. Yeah. So we get a lot of other problems. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm practicing in OMR now. A lot of software engineers come to me with something called premature ejaculation. Doctor, I, I start uh, having intercourse and it comes out within a minute's time, right? So newly married people don't generally realize that it's a two-way street, right? They need their partner to be ready. If the partner is not ready, if they, they're not uh, ready enough, which means they're not wet enough, then it automatically, you know, as soon as you go inside, the friction is too much and they ejaculate quickly. So again, we need to make their partners ready, right? So one of the big reasons for erectile dysfunction is, there's three things that you have to understand. One is your hormone level needs to be very good, your testosterone level. Number two, your blood flow, the blood vessels that carry it to the, the penis should be very good. And number three is, you have to have the desire, right? Desire to perform, desire to be with your partner. So I got a lot of patients come to me and say, very difficult to perform with the missus and so on, right? It's a joke, right? <laughs> and and uh, but I don't have a problem trying it with anybody else. Right? <laughs> so again, 
the desire, the libido should be there and that's called selective impotence when you can't perform with one specific partner or something like that. All that's possible. These are things that we see commonly. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this. It would be better if you ask me the questions and I give you the answers regarding this particular topic. Okay? Happy to answer anything regarding your urinary system and sexual function. And whatever question you ask, I will assume and all of us will assume it's for a friend of yours. <laughs> okay? So, so, ask away and I think, I think it's more livelier if you ask the questions and we'll take it forward. Okay? <laughs> How is uh, diabetics and kidney stones related? Are they related? Diabetic food? Not specifically. So I'll give you another example. So the, this diabetic uh, people, if the diabetes is not controlled very well, <coughs> then little parts of the kidney slough off and fall into the renal system. And they act as a nidus for stones to form. Right? So it's, if you have a particle that's a dead particle that's in your collecting system, and deposition on the on that particular end becomes dead and it forms a stone very quickly. As such diabetes doesn't cause stones, but it has a potential to when this sort of things happen when you don't have control over sugar. Okay. So uh, this is the talk's gonna end now and we've we really done with the, the talking bit. I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk and hopefully you'll ask me questions regarding the same. So the goal here is very simple. Awareness, awareness and awareness. Nothing else. Hey? Peace. Yes. So, once a stone former, always a stone form. Right? Yes. So, there's a very simple trick to prevent stones from form forming. Uh, but I'm not telling this outside primarily because we, we will be out of a job. <laughs> so the simple thing is you need to drink 3 liters of fluid per day. That's all. If you do that, then the, the chances of you forming a stone <coughs> come down dramatically. Right? So and also I see a lot of people drink about 1 liter as soon as they get up in the morning and then um, they don't drink anything throughout the day and so on. So it cannot be like that. Every hour, drink a glass of water. That's the better way of preventing stone formation than drinking, you know, like water therapy and all that. That's not a great thing. Okay? Alcohol. Alcohol. It dissolves the stone? It dissolves the stone. You don't worry. You don't In fact, in fact some, somebody said, if you have stone, drink too much of beer. It will dissolve. It must be Vijay Mali. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, the reason why they ask you to drink a lot of beer or something like that is for you to pass more urine and as a result the stone will get flushed up. That can happen if you drink water. Not necessarily beer, but you know, I'm not going to say no, but generally I would advise again. Doctor. Can the prostate be removed? Can it can be castrated without the by lesser surgery? Yes, yes, very good question. So, so there are two or three ways of removing the prostate, right? One is for cancer prostate, we remove the full prostate. Like imagine an orange, and then uh, you take out the entire orange, right? If you've got a big prostate, we can only take out the the inner, inner part of the orange and leave behind the skin, right? So that's what we do in laser. We just need to open out the passage so you pass even better. The prostate, when it grows, it grows into the passage, right? So again, people people with a 100 gram prostate, if it doesn't grow into the prostate, will pass urine very well. People with a 30 gram prostate, if it goes into the passage, they won't pass urine very well. So we have to scrape it. Uh, you know, like you've all seen uh, how we scrape uh, coconuts, yes? Who said that? Yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah. I mean, so, so we are the we are kind of plumbers who scrape the coconuts from inside. That can be done with laser. That can be done with conventional cautery. 
all that can be done. It's a very simple process. You need to stay in hospital only for a day and then move out. The reason why, um, you know, for big prostates, the first step is always to give medicines. You've got medicines to relax the prostate and to reduce the size of the prostate. Only if the medicines don't work, then we think about surgery. So always you will have, if you go to a urologist saying you have urinary trouble, they will put you on a, a set of medicines. And only if, it, if they don't work, will they consider doing this sort of surgery. What are Two the functions? Two questions. Function. Yes. Function or person? Who? Where? Oh. Function. Arabic. Very good. So, Sorry. function is... Uh, so, semen that comes out, a lot of it is produced in the prostate. Right? So, if I go back to that previous picture... I'm sorry, I'm going um, other other direction. Right? So, we need to go to the first... <coughs> quick thing. Let me just... Yeah, there you go. So, again, if you look at this part, this is the testicles. That's where the sperm gets produced, right? And the sperm travels up to the prostate. The sperm just, you know, it's just 1% um, of the white fluid semen that comes out is sperm. The rest of the 99% comes from seminal vesicles and the prostate, right? So, prostate's function is production of semen. The sperms cannot swim without the white fluid. The white fluid comes from the prostate. The sperms come from the testicles. So when you ejaculate, 99% comes from the prostate seminal vesicle complex. Only 1% from testicles. And that's the function. It's a sexual function. Right? After, the, after about 80, I'm going to say 1995, that function reduces a bit. But uh, yes, sir. Okay. Can you proceed, proceed? Does uh, people say that uh, ejaculation is very important? Right? Yes, very, very important. Prostate. Yeah. So, ideally, everybody um, should ejaculate. I mean, I'm not going to give you a number. If you're if you're in the 20s to 40s, it should be minimum of three times a week ejaculation. If you're in your 40s to 60s, twice or once a week ejaculations. 60 is and above as much as possible. I'm not going to put a number on it. The more you ejaculate, the better it is for your prostate health. So, so I'm sorry? Hafte me doba. Yes. Hafte me doba. Aapka basi. Hota hai do, abha chaal. Okay. Basic is how much time does it take? It takes about one hour for the value to come out. So, it's I mean, the test itself, no, the cost, it you think the cost? Yeah. How much time does it take to no. perform the BSA test? It's just a blood test. Yeah, as soon as you come to the clinic, they'll take the PSA and then you'll get an answer in about an hour's time or two hours time. But uh, some people prostrate, get, uh, PSA get triggered up when, after examination. So, Amazingly good question. So that's a, that's a very important point. So people tend to say that when you when you examine the prostate, PSA goes up, but it usually is within the value plus or minus five percent of the test range. It doesn't go up too drastically unless you massage the prostate, which is generally not the practice. Right? Uh, relationship between antibiotic and kidney. Okay, first question. Does it affect more antibiotic? Does it affect? First question. So, one okay, second one. Mommy, eight of the mommy is only. Water, two water, ten or water, water. It helps. Yeah. So again, good question. <coughs> antibiotic is a very broad term. Right? So that's like uh, saying cars. Yeah. So you have Maruti, you have Mercedes, you have Rolls Rolls Royce and all that. So out of it, there are specific antibiotics like Amikacin, Gentamicin. Those when you give for a long time have a potential to affect the kidney function. Long time means? Long time means depending on their pre-antibiotic kidney function. For somebody who is already on the borderline, even one antibiotic might cause some difficulty. Not only antibiotics, painkillers. You know, I see a lot of people go to the doctor and then say uh, knee pain and something, painkillers. 
Brufel, NSAIDS. Not good for your kidneys. Not at all good. That's why, if at all possible, try and avoid pain. Obviously, if you have a lot of pain, you need to take it. But if at all possible, painkillers have to be avoided. Antibiotics usually is prescribed by a doctor, so they will check your creatinine levels before giving the antibiotic. But painkillers are like you just go to the pharmacy and you can get one. You can just yeah, over the counter. I mean, Not great. Not at all great. Hmm? So, and all that. Generally, they say it's on the, the system, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> but it, again, it's, it, it has got some diuretic effect, like tea, uh, and as such, it has the potential to flush out your urinary system. But there is a tiny good chale at the effect. Kudi gratan. Tani. Tani. But if you see a master checkup, Today, when you go to hospital and weekly, there are plenty of options to go. What specific option is put there for checking up this point? So, like all things that are not great with our medical system, this is something that I've also realized. Uh, as soon as you go, to, because I'm not in a situation where I uh, look at the muscle checkup, because I most of the patients who come to me have specific problems, or they're referred by other urologists. So, when I went for a muscle checkup, they gave me five, six options. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you want? Right? So, again, master checkups don't look at everything from your head to foot. They can't. The goal is to look at the most commonest problems. And obviously, you know, one that has a PSA would be one that I would suggest. Right? They are made with check boxes. And again, it defeats the purpose of a master checkup exactly. because if the patient knew, won't they ask for it? So, the only trouble is awareness. How many of you knew about this PSA before I spoke today? Yeah. Very few, isn't it? So if you go to a master health checkup and they gave you a list of tick boxes and said, which one do you want, where will that lead you? Yeah. So again, hospitals are to blame. And this master health checkup concept came about because a lot of the software companies wanted to found out that having their employees get a regular master health checkup limited the amount of cash they had to pay for the insurance company, right? That's what they came up with, right? But then again, um, a lot to be desired in the master check. I would suggest a most, more comprehensive health package. That should be done. What about the sleeping pills? Sleeping pills. That affects the kidneys? Not really. Not, not specifically yeah, really. sleeping pills. But... Uh, I would generally not advise long-term usage of sleeping pills. Right? So, for certain specific time periods, it's acceptable to take sleeping pills. But beyond that, not really. Right? No long-term usage. They're not good for us. Once you get used to it, then you won't get the sleep. Oh, yeah. So, so one of the ways in which we can do that is work enough so that you're tired and you go to bed. As soon as you go to bed, physical. That driver. Yes, what causes cancer? What causes cancer? If this, the New York Times said, yes, living causes cancer. So that's a Nobel Prize winning question. <laughs> <laughs> so as it stands now, we don't have an answer. But we're getting there. You know, you uh, right now we know for. Um, or there could be some genetic predisposition and so on. If you ask me what specifically causes cancer, we don't really have an answer to you. But there are a lot of theories out there. Yeah. Some is environmentally. So even prostate cancer. Well, let me give you an example. The Japanese have one of the lowest incidences of prostate cancer. Right? Japanese people. Right? If the same <coughs> Japanese guy goes and settles in Hawaii, which is halfway between the U.S. coast and Japan, right? So, this risk doubles, right? If the son of that Japanese immigrant settles in America, he's got the same risk as an American to develop prostate cancer. So, genetics is one part, but then the environment is another part as well, right? So, the same guy from Japan goes to America and his risk doubles. So, a lot of things that we in India do, which is aping the West, may not be great. 
you know, which diet is best for us. A lot of people ask me. The diet that our grandfather mother ate, you know, grandfather or his grandfather, that is the best diet. None of this wiki business and the Zomato business. But I'm also guilty of utilizing a lot of that. Japanese are one of the highest smokers. Yes. But so uh, still they, you said they don't get prostate cancer. They get a lot of stomach cancer. They don't get prostate cancer. It's not that much. Stomach cancer, a lot of stomach cancer, Japanese cancer. Especially the food that they eat, the tempura and all that, uh, not good. Uh, just putting a case in front of you, there's a patient who's suffering with the Parkinson. Mm. Uh, he's at the age of probably say 73. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, what precaution measures we need to take if they could be we can just understand some symptoms that there could be a prostate cancer because its uh, control functions are like yeah. uh, from it's it's Parkinson's again is a very difficult situation. That's a situation where the bladder constantly is a bit irritated and it pushes, pushes and pushes more urine outside. So he needs a proper evaluation to be honest. Right? Get him to a urologist, get him checked out and then he'll probably give you that answer that you're looking for. Right? Can we ask a question? No. Let's say you, the quiz question I put you. Oh yes, oh yes. So again, um, it's a very, very simple question. How big is the prostate? 100 grams. Uh, 5, 5 millimeters of the needle. I'm going to give a Six big present for this answer. Right? If anybody gives us. Not you, Venkat. Huh? <laughs> 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 Let me Google it. It's the size of this. 5 grams of the needle. Uh, grams are a little more. You can say any, 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 any dimension, anything you can say. If you're close, uh, it's, it's like, uh, you know, what are your dimension for that? Mm. Or you can use uh, fruits. Or in or or grape, grape. 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 Right. Reasonably good answer. Grape. Kutti orange. Kutti orange. Lemon size, right? Lemon it's usually size. 20 Korean grams. <laughs> it's usually 20 grams uh, when you start out at the age of 20. It must be about 25 or 30 cubic centimeters. And as you grow less and less younger, every year the prostate grows. That is the only organ in the body that grows, right? Imagine, imagine your hand. As you grow older, does it become bigger? No. Or your penis? Yes. Does it grow bigger every year? Imagine if it did. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, one question. Some How do you really weigh it? How do you really weigh it? So, again, the, the, the way of weighing it is with the scan, ultrasound scan. We don't weigh it. We look at the dimensions and give you a reasonably good answer. Right? Every, every year, it grows progressively bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time you reach about uh, 70 or 80, 20, 40 to 50 gram size. With anything beyond that, it's going to trouble you. A big prostate is generally trouble. Right? So it starts out like a lemon and becomes like an orange. Right? Hopefully it doesn't become a coconut or Yeah, yeah, Kandipa. Kandipa.